Grant was born in Point Pleasant, right across from Kentucky. At age one, his family moved to Georgetown. Ulysses' father owned a tannery, and it smelled and sounded terrible, and Ulysses didn't want anything to do with it. But Ulysses loved horses, and early on, his parents entrusted him with a horse, and he, as a very young boy, would make trips down into Kentucky, and Ulysses himself says that he rode on every bit of road within a 50-mile radius of where he lived. Grant grew up in Georgetown, Ohio, but his father was always looking for the best education. And one of the best places for an education was in Maysville, Kentucky. So when Grant was maybe 15 years of age, he went for one year of education in Maysville. And he studies there for about eight months at the end of 36 and early 37. Ulysses had quite a few relatives who lived in Maysville. So he may have lived with various people. At age 17, really his father said, I think you should go to West Point. It's a free education. It was one of the only three engineering schools. And this says something about the relationship of children and parents in the 19th century. He said, well, I don't really want to do that, but if you think I should, I will. So he enrolled at West Point, barely 17 years old. When he arrived, his name was actually Hiram Ulysses Grant. Thomas Hamer, who nominated him as congressman from Ohio, thought his name was Ulysses S. Grant because everybody referred to him as Ulysses. And at that time, the oldest son generally took their middle name from their mother's maiden name, which was Hannah Simpson. At that point, he becomes Ulysses S. Grant. He graduated age 21. He was uh, stationed out in St. Louis. It was there that he met his roommate's sister, Julia and they fell quickly in love, and it became one of the great matches and marriages. He became so proficient at math uh, after his uh, West Point graduation that he seriously considered teaching math in college, and he applied to teach at West Point. Uh, that did not occur. The Mexican War came. He then participated in the Mexican-American War and then was posted to Oregon. He couldn't take her with him. She was pregnant with their second child. He then served in Oregon, became very lonely and depressed, went to California, Fort Humboldt, more so. He missed Julia and the children he'd never, the child, the second child he'd never seen. He probably fell into drinking. The story is a little bit mixed or mired. He might have been threatened with a court martial. He resigned and came home to Missouri and he struggled. Grant was happy to uh, rejoin his family. He was certainly a very proud father and husband, happy to be here with his loved ones. But at the same time that he enjoyed this time with his family, he also struggled financially. Uh, his father-in-law's plantation, Whitehaven, had never been a great success. Uh, Grant struggled to make a living as a farmhand on the property and actually resorted uh, to a number of odd jobs to help pay the bills. In 1854, Jesse Grant, Ulysses' father sold his tannery in Bethel, Ohio, and moved to Covington, Kentucky, where he opened a leather goods store and went into that business, and also belonged to a Methodist church down there with other anti-slave families. Jesse Grant, Ulysses Grant's father and his mother, Hannah, were very dedicated Methodists, very faithful. Uh, she was extremely devout. Uh, he uh, was a trustee and a, a leader in the church, and as a dedicated church member and leader, uh, he purchased a pew, and it was Jesse's pew, and it's been uh, uh, saved and is now uh, uh, has been on, is on loan uh, at the, the uh, Civil War Museum in Fort Wright. Now, Jesse was strongly anti-slavery, and that's why he wanted to live north of the Ohio River in Ohio. And uh, when Grant marries Julia, the story is that uh, Jesse and his wife are not going to attend the wedding because he's marrying into a slaveholding family. And yet, for whatever reason, it's a little unclear, Jesse ends up living in Covington, Kentucky. Jesse ends up being the postmaster for Covington, Kentucky. So when he moves to Covington, he opens a leather goods store, not only in Covington, but he also invests in them in a few other cities, including Chicago and a small town called Galena up in the very northwest corner of Illinois. 
and that's a trading town. So in 1860, Ulysses travels back to Covington to ask his father for a job, and his father agrees as long as it's up in Galena. Ulysses takes his family, Julia, and their four children at that point, and they move up to Galena, where he's a clerk to his younger brother, who is really running the store, Orville, um, and works for them. All of a sudden, in April of 1861, Fort Sumter gets fired on. So Grant walks out of the clerk store, and he said it was one of the happiest moments he ever had. He never was a clerk again, never had to be a clerk again in his life. George McClellan was stationed in Cincinnati, and Grant goes to see him. They had met actually out west. Well, Grant arrives in Covington, and McClellan's aide said, well, the general's out a little bit. He'll be back shortly. So Grant waits all day, and no McClellan. Oh, come back tomorrow. He comes back tomorrow and waits all day, no McClellan. Did McClellan stand him up? Well, we'll never know. But that, interestingly, is a catalyst for Grant standing up on his own and going back to Illinois, where he first has a desk job in Springfield. He helps muster in new regiments, troops, um, and acts as an adjunct to the state. He lives in a little nook up in the old state house, which is still there. It's called Grant's Nook in a little corner under a staircase, and that's where he does all this work. Travels back and forth between Galena and Springfield, and finally, he gets a command by Illinois Congressman Elihu Washburn, and he becomes Colonel of the 21st Illinois Infantry Division. He does so well in that Grant's career is off and running. <laughs> 